There are few earthly things more beautiful than a university, wrote John Macefield in his tribute to English universities, and his words are equally true today. He did not refer to towers or to campuses. He admired the splendid beauty of a university because it was, he said, a place where those who hate ignorance may strive to know, where those who perceive truth may strive to make others see. starts with the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was held on a plot of land to the northeast of the site in Hyde Park. The momentum for the show primarily came from the Prince Consul, who had become concerned that Britain was falling behind other nations in manufacture and education. He served as President to the Royal Commission for the exhibition, and after its success, he wanted to keep the initiative going. In discussion with the other commissioners, he proposed that rather than using the profit to fund future exhibitions, as originally planned, he suggested they buy land on which to develop an area of London to include schools of art and science alongside relevant museums. He said, I would buy that ground and place on it four institutions corresponding to the four great sections of the exhibition, raw material, machinery, manufactures and plastic art. I would devote these institutions to the furtherance of the industrial pursuits of all nations in these four divisions. Covering nearly 19 acres and welcoming over 6 million visitors, the exhibition proved to be a huge success. It made a profit of £186,000, an enormous sum in the mid-19th century. After the exhibition closed, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary, To think that all this great and bright time has passed, like a dream, after all its success and triumph, and that all the labour and anxiety it caused for nearly two years should likewise now be only remembered as a has-been, seems incredible and melancholy. The Queen's husband, Prince Albert, served as president of the Royal Commission which organised the exhibition, and it was he who saw to it that it left a great legacy. He proposed the commission buy land on which to create a centre dedicated to science and art and the education of the population in these subjects. The Royal Commission followed the Prince's advice and used part of the profit to purchase the Kensington Gore Estate and surrounding lands in West London. By 1857, the new South Kensington Museum, later the Victoria and Albert Museum, opened on part of the land, and in April 1860, the Times referred to the rising suburb of Albertopolis, south of the Kensington Road. The nickname Albertopolis was then born. Perhaps it was at first adopted in a slightly mocking tone at how deeply the Prince had become involved in the project, but at the same time it was a tribute to the Prince's initiative and vision. One of the commissioners, Henry Cole, christened the area South Kensington, and with Prince Albert's vision and the drive of Cole, the area went on to become a hive of building activity, with new museums and educational institutions setting up home there. The South Kensington Museum, which was the first museum to open in the area, opening in 1857 and becoming the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1899. The Royal Horticultural Society Gardens, which occupied 20 acres of land in South Kensington, from 1861 until around 1886. The Gothic Revival landmark at the northernmost end of the site, the Albert Memorial, completed in 1872, a monument was erected in honour of Prince Albert, the visionary behind the area. The Natural History Museum, which opened in a new building designed by Alfred Waterhouse in 1881. However, the project to move the natural history collections of the British Museum began back in 1860. 
the iconic Royal Albert Hall, built between 1867 and 1871, to serve not only as a concert venue, but also as a conference and meeting centre. The Imperial Institute, a French Renaissance-style building by Thomas Edward Colcott. The Institute opened in 1893 and went on to become the subject of much debate and change. Partially demolished in the 1850s, it became part of Imperial College London, which encompassed many surrounding buildings by other well-known architects, including Sir Aston Webb. years ago the City and Guilds College joined with the Royal College of Science and the Royal School of Mines and moved to South Kensington to form Imperial College, now the biggest concentration of technological and scientific research and education in Britain. The Imperial Institute is clearly visible in the centre of the photograph. Across Imperial Institute Road, now Imperial College Road, are the Chemistry and Physics Departments of the Royal College of Science. Perhaps the only recognizable college buildings are those in Bate Quad. The Union Building, however, has yet to receive its two uppermost floors. The former Huxley Building is just visible opposite the Science Museum and the City and Guilds College still stands on Exhibition Road. In the 1970s, a solitary Queen's Tower remains after the expansion program. The City and Guilds College has been replaced by the Mechanical Engineering Department. The South Side Halls and the Sports Centre have been built, as well as the Civil and Electrical and Chemical Engineering, Chemistry, Blackett and Roderick Hill buildings. Some space has been cleared for the new Huxley Building on Queen's Gate and the Union Building now has two extra floors. On the site of the old South Side Halls, demolished in the summer of 2005, New South Side Halls Stand, opened in 2007. East Side with its three student halls of residence mirrors the design of New South Side. Its opening, in October 2009, marked the completion of the Prince's Gardens project, which aimed to recreate the sense of enclosure and recapture the spirit of the original gardens. The new sports centre called Ethos opened in 2006. We have been very concerned uh, in this college in the past uh, at the uh, relative lack of social uh, uh, and residential accommodation. Now, today, with the opening of these halls, we can accommodate 618 students, about 20% of our student population. And on this splendid site, there is room uh, for that number eventually to be doubled. Now, Your Royal Highness, this, uh, these buildings which you are now opening uh, represent a reinterpretation of the social pattern which is common uh, in the universities of Oxford and Cambridge and in other halls of residence. The refectory and the common rooms will be open not only to the residents but also to all members of the college. And therefore, they will have uh, the, the opportunity uh, of sharing with those who are resident uh, in these uh, amenities. Many of them uh, are scattered throughout West London in lodgings. Finally, I would like to refer to our architect, Mr. Richard Shepherd. Uh, I think you will be interested to see how he has laid out these common rooms and how he has applied the staircase principle uh, of an Oxford and Cambridge college uh, to a large and high building. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind way in which you have welcomed us here this afternoon. We are delighted to be here, not least as interested neighbours who have heard reports of your exciting new developments during the time of construction. The opportunity to rebuild a London Square, especially one in such an important position, 
hardly ever arises nowadays. And the fact that it should fall to a university institution added considerable interest. One always hopes that the standard of architecture is high for any college. But this college in particular, because of your close interest in structural design and architecture itself. The University of Kiel had the great blessing of space, but you are in a different position in the heart of the West End with land costly and scarce. Here was a challenge to your architects to achieve a high density of development, but yet to produce a physical environment satisfying to an academic community. We cannot yet see the whole pattern of the future of this square, but here in the south side, we can see a building which makes a distinguished and challenging contribution to the London scene. I would like to congratulate all those who were together in the design and execution of this splendid new achievement. This square is now to become the home of young men, some of whom will, we hope and expect, become the leaders of tomorrow. You have indeed a distinguished list of men who have lived here in the past. I hope that the students listening today may go on to provide an intellectual leadership as vigorous as that which flourished here nearly a century ago. I hope also that they will be equally inspired by the thought of the four men whose names have been given to the four halls above us. Falmouth, Keogh, Selkirk, and Tizard. Four men who gave outstanding and selfless service to this college and to this country in the past. Wilson once said that every man sent out from a university should be a man of his nation as well as a man of his time. All around the world there's evidence of the work of engineers who have graduated from the college and they've influenced many aspects of modern life. Six years after finishing his studies at the college in 1893, Cecil Booth invented the process of cleaning fabrics by sucking air through them. His vacuum cleaning process was patented in 1901 and Booth built his first equipment shortly afterwards. Probably the greatest British electronics engineer this century and the most prolific electronic engineer was Alan Bloomline who graduated in 1923 from the City and Guilds College. In his short life he was killed in 1942. He was granted 128 patents, one for every six weeks of his working life. Much of the success of one great British company was built on the work of this one man. He developed an extraordinary range of principles, designs and products in acoustics, radio, electronics, telephony, stereo recording and reproduction. He devised the first composite video waveform for high definition television, which in concept is still used. He invented many electronic circuits, including radar systems that were vital to wartime use of airborne radar. It was while testing one of these radar systems that he was killed in an air crash. Another graduate in civil and mechanical engineering was Freeman, later Sir Ralph Freeman. His work is even more visible, the very famous Harbour Bridge in Sydney. One of the most well-known names in the world for a racing car is Bluebird, the name given by Donald Campbell to the car with which he sought and captured many land speed records. Campbell was one of the first to have the effect of lifting forces on a racing car, in this case Bluebird, checked with the aid of a wind tunnel in and based on research in the Department of Aeronautics at the college. The contribution of the college and its graduates to the war effort during 1939 to 45 was immense, contributing to several well-known engineering achievements which 
proved to be of immense importance to the success of the D-Day landings in Normandy in 1944. In particular, Mulberry and Pluto. Mulberry was the name given to the artificial harbour that was constructed and floated across the channel to allow the flow of supplies to the troops fighting on the European mainland. Pluto stands for pipeline under the ocean, a pipeline through which fuel supplies were channeled with great efficiency from the south coast of England to the European mainland. The contributions of the college were recognised at the highest level during the visit of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, now the Queen Mother, to the centenary celebrations of the Imperial College in the Albert Hall in October 1945. I know that the success of our D-Day invasion was in great part due to engineers trained in your city. Engineers who were trained in your city and Gills College. In more recent years, one of the professors in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Dennis Gabor, became the first electronic engineer to win the Nobel Prize, in his case, specifically for his invention of holography. The hologram captures three-dimensional information about a scene or image on a single plane, two-dimensional surface. With the aid of a source of pure light, for example from a laser, the original complete three-dimensional image can be reconstructed from this hologram. The commonest day-to-day -day sight of a white light hologram now is on a credit card, but there are important industrial and scientific applications also. Gabor also worked on a flat TV display, although his work has since been overtaken by solid-state devices. These days, the college is greatly in demand by industry because of its facilities and expert knowledge. For instance, the Honda wind tunnel in the Department of Aeronautics is a valuable asset in the study of the aerodynamics of buildings and of motor vehicles. In the Department of Electrical Engineering, amongst many other major developments, Innovative work on linear electric motors for propulsion is now extensively used, for example, on light railway systems. The expertise of the civil engineering department has been utilised on a number of major projects from the structural stress patterns in elevated motorways to the design of the Thames flood control barrier. Its expert knowledge of earthquake engineering is also much in demand. Experiments on the department's shake table provide graphic demonstration of the need for special design principles for protection against seismic disturbances in many parts of the world. Now, if the first characteristic of the college is balance, the second, I think, is quality. Undergraduate work is a full-time honours degree standard, and there is an exceptionally big postgraduate school, the largest in the country. More than a third of the 2,450 students of the college are postgraduates. They come to carry out research and also to take part in the advanced courses which form a special feature of our academic arrangements. As an example of these a postgraduate course in nuclear power has just been started. Incidentally, our postgraduate students come from all parts of the country and the Commonwealth and indeed from all over the world. The college has now been selected by the government to lead the expansion of higher technological education in this country. We have already grown by 800 students in four years. New buildings have gone up and are in use, and the second stage of our building program, which is to cost about two and a half millions, is already underway. This college was founded to train students and to undertake research 
in science and technology and its applications to industry. Over the years, the details have changed, but the purpose remains the same. Our students today have horizons extending far beyond the scope of their own discipline. And this they are achieving largely by their own efforts, but with some help from us. <laughs> One in five of our students come from overseas, and many of them from countries which, when the college was formed, was part of the British Empire. Today, they come as equals to share in our work and in our life. Your Majesty, I can assure you that we regard this as a privilege and as a source of deep satisfaction. It takes me back to my own career, the beginning of my own career, when I found great fascination both in doing research and in knowing that one might be taking part in developing things which would be of great use to the people of my generation when great new things were then underfoot and great new materials were being developed. I'm particularly glad to be back to this college. I have been here before and been through some of the research work in the labs. But also, when I travel the world and go to other countries, I will frequently find, as I did comparatively recently in Hong Kong, great new electronic industries going, run by very, very able young men and women. And I say to them, but this is marvelous. You've got a new business going very quickly. It all has absolutely the latest things. Tell me, where did you train? Imperial College of Science, <laughs> almost always. And so really this particular college has had a very, very great output of very distinguished students who've gone the world over. Wherever I go, we need more electronic engineers, more mechanical engineers, more civil engineers, and particularly those who have an entrepreneurial spirit, who actually want to go and work in industry, who actually want to go and work on creating some of the great projects which are so much a feature of our modern life. Over the years, the demands of technological education and research have placed strains on the site, and the South Kensington campus is now a tightly packed concentration of lecture rooms, laboratories, offices and libraries, and of course, people. With some 3,000 students in the City and Guilds College, student life too has had to evolve over the years. Perhaps the sports days of the past are now merely history. but the annual Morphy Cup boat race at Putney still draws many students down to the riverbank. In 1928, things were much the same, but perhaps the transport facilities look rather different these days. However, the motor club faithfully maintains the inviolate mascot, Boanerges, our James and Brown AW38, built in Hammersmith in 1902 and still a notable entrant in the London to Brighton veteran car run each November. The college was rebuilt in the years between 1960 and 1975 to accommodate the demands of growth. The transitional period as the various departments, here the Department of Mechanical Engineering, took over their new buildings, has left some record of how different things were even 30 years ago. The spacious interior of the original building has given way to efficient, functional new buildings, and even since then, things have changed.
lectures and students do not look quite the same as they did. This film has concentrated mainly on historical developments, selecting merely a tiny fraction of the college's past research, rather than what is going on uh, at present. Now the college is well into its second century with the accolade of having every one of its engineering departments ranked as of the highest quality, judged by the most stringent international standards. to put into words what this day means to Imperial College. It's a day that belongs to everyone who has worked and studied here in the last century. Thank you all for coming to join us on this proud day. It was Albert's bold vision that created this hub of culture of science and arts in South Kensington. And as is so often the case with visionaries, he faced a chorus of scepticism, not least from the House of Commons, which feared that his great exhibition would encourage foreign rogues to invade the country. But Albert persevered and brought his plan to reality. The exhibition was an enormous success, and its profits were used to purchase the land on which Imperial and its neighbours were built and flourish to this day. Albert's imagination his pioneering spirit, his determination to pursue progress against the odds were characteristics that set the tone for Imperial from the outset and still play a huge part in its continuing success. Important innovations and breakthroughs are increasingly found where researchers of different specialisms work together in partnership. From this kind of work will grow the pioneering ideas that improve the quality of life worldwide and also help to ensure UK's economic prosperity. What we do here today, the world will rely on tomorrow. <laughs>